today I want to just talk a little bit about the leapfrog journey, uh, but also uh, about areas in which, uh, and I, I think we just look, need to look at ourselves harder. Don't think we're looking at ourselves hard enough. I don't think we're being competitive enough, and I don't think we're being ambitious enough. Uh, so before we all celebrate uh, the Economist, which is wonderful, and others uh, mainstreaming the field and so forth, I think we just need to take a little bit of a harder look. So I'll be talking to you about how to think about that. When I started LeapFrog uh, in January 2007, uh, it was obviously a very, very different world. I mean, we're talking about uh, Bush and Blair and Blackberries, right? Uh, and uh, we're talking about a moment where the markets were fairly euphoric uh, prior to the global financial crisis. Uh, interestingly, what has remained constant through all these crazy cycles and this volatility that we've seen is, I guess, what we'd call the beta thesis, which is we saw that uh, billions of people were joining the grid through mobile. Uh, so you've had basically half of humanity who were significantly excluded joining the grid through mobile. And you've had in Asia and in Africa massive adoption of mobile and often leapfrogging over old technologies, so people starting with cheap smartphones. And as those billions of people rise and their incomes rise, there are an extraordinary set of businesses that are serving them in very low cost and powerful ways. And these are the future Prudentials, or if you like, the future uh, Alibabas in the kinds of markets we work in. And we work across many markets in Asia and Africa, such as India, Indonesia, Nigeria, Kenya, and so forth. And that thesis has continued through the ups and through the downs and through the commodity cycles and so on. There is no doubt that these billions are rising and that there are an extraordinary group of people from the hundreds of millions of people emerging into the middle class who are either starting or leading businesses that are highly investable. The second thing that has really continued, and this was an early commitment of LeapFrog and I think is why we got to the, the early scale we did, was that Markets have not changed their worldview in terms of risk and reward fundamentally. They are not going to, as fiduciaries, um, say we're going to accept a significant trade-off with a large part of our capital. Where you have a major pension fund or a major insurer and you know, 10 of the world's largest players in that space are investors in LeapFrog, you sit there with a very large investment book worried about pensioners' futures. And there is no way you are going to accept a significant trade-off. Now, here's where we're not being competitive enough and where I think the message broke through to those players and where I still think we as a field are not articulate enough. We say often, I hear people saying, you, okay, there are those who understand we're a broad spectrum in impact. There are incredibly valuable things done at subsidized or reduced returns. There's no doubt about it. But in terms of scale and in terms of truly having a, an impact across a very large number of people, you're going to have to generate commercial returns. Now, how people make the argument for the commercial returns is, well, we're as good as, or there's no trade-off. You've all heard this. That is just not a compelling structure of argument for a fiduciary. Why? Because as they look at this deal in a strategy or a sector that's new to them, as good as means the rewards are the same, but the costs to them and the risk to them are higher because the cost is they've got to do more work to get familiar with it, and the risk is it's something new for them. So the argument you're going to get the same return, there's no trade-off but you're going to put in more risk and more effort is not a compelling proposition for a very large institutional investor. So we just need to get beyond this there's no trade-off statement and start talking about synergies. How is it that we get outsized returns and outsized impact by putting these two things together? There are a number of spaces in which this is possible. So for example, we've invested in mobile insurers, where obviously, as people are getting onto mobile, they're wanting to protect themselves. They get basic safety nets. We invest in a company called Bima that went from 1 million customers to after six years now serving 30 million people across 16 different countries. 
And that business model is a profitable business model has a level of appeal to investors, as do some of the other companies, that shows how you can bring safety nets to very large numbers of low-income people, and you can generate outsized returns and get outsized growth because you're working into this intensive high-growth market. So first of all, we're not being competitive enough in the way we frame things. We need to look at not just talent attraction, which I heard earlier, but all the areas of both beta and alpha that are going to allow us to make the case that this is the place that the capital should flow. This is where you should put your money, because capital flows to where it's best treated. And we're not going to get past that. Now, the second thing is in the history of uh, financial markets, if we want to look back on this year and say this was the year where things changed, <laughs> this was the year where major players entered the space and there was dramatic scaling after uh, a decade or more of work in the field, well, we're going to have to see not just that scale of institutional capital impact, but a level of impact across different markets and across large numbers of people. Otherwise, it continues to be uninteresting now to operators, to the large institutions who own the buildings as you walk around here and own, you know, when I'm in Jakarta or Mumbai, there's a similar building all around. Those folks are operating very large companies and they're going to want to see how this is relevant to the business that they do across many, many markets. So when LeapFrog set out, we said we are going to reach 25 million people in 10 years. And as you can see, the title of my talk is a decade. Uh, and we said those people are going to be low-income people, people living on between 2 and $10 a day. So not the destitute, to be clear, but low-income people. And we're going to reach them with an array of financial tools that they haven't had before, in particular insurance, pensions, savings, not simply credit, um, as well as now healthcare. If you fast forward to today, uh, it's 10 years later, um, our companies are about to reach 100 million people, of whom 76 million are low income and emerging consumers. Now, if you think about those numbers, that starts becoming something that is interesting to a Prudential or a MetLife or an AIG because it can have a genuine impact on the number of customers they serve if they replicate this or find ways to buy these companies or engage with these companies. And it can have a genuine impact over time on the balance sheet, which is enormous. Until we start thinking at that scale, how can you really provide transformative business models that are not wonderful to tell as stories, but are actually reaching tens of millions of people? You are going to have a hard time getting the major institutional operators to do profit with purpose. So I think we need to be a lot more ambitious about the sort of scale of the number of people we reach, and we need to look harder at the business models that we're working on. I think a third thing that we have really not uh, done as well as we should have is focusing on making this field magnetic. Now, everybody thinks that, oh, there's so much attention paid to impact investing these days. But I'd like to compare any company in the impact investing space to the attention that Uber gets or a host of other technology players that I can mention. If you compare yourself against that bar, the world looks very different. If this is indeed a absolutely transformative field that is going to intermediate capital in a fundamentally different way and transform the way business is done, let's see that argument put better. Let's see ourselves making the case for why that is, not by saying, oh, we managed to get into The Economist, but by comparing ourselves to the other radically transformative technologies and strategies out there. So net-net, my view after 10 years and investing in and exiting many companies now and reaching almost 100 million people is that the ambition, having a greater ambition and looking harder at ourselves so we make the case through the eyes of fiduciaries and major operators is going to be what really allows us to 
change the world and see this as a legacy moment. It's not just telling one story after another or being hopeful anymore, which was a big part of what we had to do. It's really making the case against the other options for capital, for investment, and showing that profit with purpose really does generate outsized returns and outsized impact as a synergy. Thank you. Andy, thank you. We have time for, for one question from me. And I wonder, you know, we have a room full of people who, when you started out here, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have come to this kind of event. Um, they're attracting capital to them, big institutions, so that the landscape has changed. And do you worry to, to, to an extent that that capital gets, gets sucked to big institutions, big asset managers, and actually the impact side of things gets lost? It's easy for people to tell themselves, I'm doing impact investing, but the outcomes on the social side are less good. Yeah. Uh, I think it is a real risk, but I also think that there's an incredibly simplistic view that somehow these institutions are wolves in sheep's clothing, or they're the transformation of the sector and all wonderful. And clearly within sectors you have good players and bad players, you have those who really focus on delivering impact and you will have those who aren't so focused on it. Um, I think there's a very important role for the long-standing players like LeapFrog and others to set the bar and the standard and for industry bodies to set the bar and the standard to hold those folks accountable. But I also think if you actually look at these institutions, stopping, you know, clapping so wildly as they allocate five people within, you know, a vast institution to this, and rather actually looking at how much they're doing, how many people are they allocating, are they really focused on this, or are they just seeing it as something they have to fill in as a gap is important. And then understanding are the leadership putting their names behind it, putting push behind it, and are they really driving towards scale? And then are they holding themselves accountable? Where where is the 25 million person number uh, that they're putting out? Where is the impact assessment? Not just don't worry, we'll have EY do an assessment, uh, but where is the actual commitment to having a significant measurement and impact team? Where is the significant commitment to managing the scale um, that they're going to face across their portfolios? And where can we pounce on them and say, that is not impact investing. That may be responsible investing. Uh, it may be all sorts of things. But that is not the argument for a commercial outsized return and impact that is intentionally generated, that are intentionally generated together. So I think we have to do those with the large institutions. And similarly, we have to stop saying small is beautiful. Uh, you know, let me tell you a wonderful story story of another social entrepreneur who I, you know, I may support personally and who I think is amazing, are amazing, but we've got to look at those entrepreneurs who are really dedicated to scale. You know, we have a, a credit business in, uh, in India that has grown in five years from reaching zero people to reaching 30 million people. And we're now working with a major reinsurer on a catas catastrophe bond that will see 30 million people insured on day one. Right? So if you can do those kinds of impacts, you can really have a, a, a very, very changed world very swiftly if you add that up and a whole number of people do that in India. And I think we as a, as a sector need to start focusing on the, this hyper-scalable models as well as these large models and holding both accountable for scale and for impact. Okay.